Plaintiffs claim that the product was manufactured in a defective manner. To establish this claim, the plaintiffs must prove all of the following elements by a preponderance greater weight of the credible evidence. One, the products contained a manufacturing defect which made the products not reasonably safe. To determine if a product had a manufacturing defect, we must decide what the condition of the product as planned should have been according to the defendant's design specifications and what its condition was as it was made. If you find there is no difference between the two conditions, there was no manufacturing defect. If there was a difference, you must decide if that difference made the product not reasonably safe for its intended or foreseeable uses. Let me repeat that because I missed a word. If there was a difference, you must decide if that difference made the product not reasonably safe for its intended or reasonably foreseeable uses. If the answer is yes, then you have found the product to be defective. The plaintiff need not prove the defendants knew of the defect or that the defendants caused the defect to occur. Whether there was a manufacturing defect in the product may be shown to you by the plaintiffs in one of two ways. First of all, it may be demonstrated by direct evidence, such as a defective part. Second, you may infer that there was a defect by reasoning from the circumstances and facts shown. The plaintiffs say the product was defective because it contained asbestos and thereby failed to meet the defendant's own specifications to be asbestos-free. The defendants say the product was not defective because it did not contain asbestos. This element may be established by proof that the product deviated from the maker's own design specifications. Two, that the defect existed before the product left the control of the defendants. Three, that the plaintiffs were direct or reasonable foreseeable users or persons who might reasonably be expected to come into contact with the product or products. Four, that the manufacturing defect was a proximate cause of the plaintiff's injuries. The last requirement for holding the defendant liable is that the defective, the defect must have been a proximate cause of the injury. Proximate cause means that the manufacturing defect in the product was a substantial factor which singly or in combination with another cause or causes brought about the injury. The plaintiffs need not prove that this same injury which occurred could have been anticipated so long as it was reasonably, so long as it was foreseeable that some significant harm could result from the manufacturing defect. If the manufacturing defect does not add to the risk of the occurrence of a particular injury and hence was not a contributing factor in the happening of the injury, then the plaintiffs have failed to establish that the manufacturing defect was the proximate cause of the injury. Remember, by proximate cause, it is meant that the manufacturing defect was a substantial factor which singly or in combination with another cause brought about the injury. Substantial means that the product was an efficient cause of the plaintiff's injury. Liability should not be imposed on mere guesswork. By proximate cause, we mean that the product was an efficient cause of the plaintiff's injury and not trivial or inconsequential. It is not necessary for an exposure to be the sole or even the dominant cause of the plaintiff's injury in order to be considered a proximate cause. There can be many proximate causes of an injury or disease and there can be many substantial contributing factors to an injury. In that regard, substantial means that it is not an imaginary or fanciful factor having no connection whatsoever or only an insignificant connection with the harm. The word substantial refers not to quantity but to quality. The fact that there may have been other independent or contributing causes does not relieve the defendant from liability. There may be more than one substantial factor in bringing about the harm suffered by the plaintiff. If you find that a plaintiff's use of or exposure to a product manufactured, sold, and or distributed by the defendant was not a substantial contributing factor in causing their mesothelioma, then you should find for the defendants. If after considering all of the evidence, you conclude that a plaintiff's use or exposure to the defendant's product was a substantial contributing factor in causing their mesothelioma, you must conclude that the plaintiff established proximate cause as the defendant, even if you also believe that some other exposure that they had was also a substantial contributing factor in bringing about their disease. I shall now instruct you on the law governing damages in the event you decide the liability issue in favor of the plaintiffs. 
if you find more than one defendant liable to any of the plaintiffs, you will be required to apportion among the liable defendants their respective contributions to the cause of that plaintiff's mesothelioma. The percentages must add up to 100%. The burden of proof on the issue of apportionment is upon the defendants. In considering whether faults may be apportioned among the defendants, you may consider whatever factors based upon the evidence that you determine to be relevant. The fact that I instruct you on damages should not be considered as suggesting any view of mine about which party is entitled to prevail in this case. Instructions or damages are given for your guidance in the event that you find any of the plaintiffs are entitled to a verdict. I am required to provide instructions on damages in all cases where the trial includes a claim for damages. The plaintiffs have the burden of establishing by preponderance of the evidence each item of damages that they claim. The plaintiffs must also prove that the damages were the natural and probable consequences of the defendant's actions. The actions must have been a proximate cause of the damages. Damages may not be based on conjecture or speculation. If you find for any of the plaintiffs, they are entitled to recover fair and reasonable money damages for the full extent of the harm caused, no more and no less. Plaintiff David Etheridge is seeking damages for his lost earnings. For Plaintiff Deborah David Etheridge, his past and future lost earnings have been stipulated to. The reasonable range of those earnings had he not become ill is $1,328,127 to $1,434,358. Plaintiffs D'Angelo McNeil, William Browning, and Douglas Barton have not claimed lost wage income <coughs> as part of their damages claim. Because no claim or evidence of lost wage income has been submitted for Plaintiffs D'Angelo McNeil, William Browning, and Douglas Barton, you should not consider lost wage income for these plaintiffs as part of any damage calculation. In all of the cases, the plaintiffs are seeking damages for their pain and suffering, disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life, and their spouse's loss of consortium. I will now discuss these categories of damages with you. If you find for a plaintiff, he or she is entitled to recover fair and reasonable compensation for the full extent of the harm and losses caused, no more and no less. Fair and reasonable compensation means to make the plaintiff's whole for any permanent or temporary injury and the consequences of that injury or injuries approximately caused by the defendant's crimes. Disability or impairment means worsening, weakening, or loss of faculties, health, or ability to participate in activities, including the inability to pursue one's normal pleasure and enjoyment. You must determine how the injury deprived the plaintiff of his or her customary activities as a whole person. <coughs> this measure of damages is what a reasonable person would consider to be adequate and just under all of the circumstances of the case to compensate the plaintiff for his or her injury and his or her consequent disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life. The law also recognizes as proper items for recovery the pain, physical and mental suffering, discomfort, and distress that a person may endure as a natural consequence of the injury. The measure of damages is what a reasonable person would consider to be adequate and just under all of the circumstances to compensate a plaintiff. Here are some factors you may want to take into account when fixing the amount of the award for disability, impairment, loss of enjoyment of life, pain, and suffering. You may consider the person's age, usual activities, occupation, family responsibilities, and similar relevant facts in evaluating the probable consequences of any injury you find they have suffered. You are to consider the nature, character, and seriousness of any injury, discomfort, or disfigurement. You may also consider their duration, as any award you make must cover the damages suffered by the plaintiffs from the onset of their disease to the time that he or she dies. The law does not provide you with any table, schedule, or formula by which a person's pain and suffering, disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life may be measured in terms of money. That amount is left to your sound discretion. You are to use your sound discretion to attempt to make the plaintiffs whole as far as money can do so, based upon reason and sound judgment, without any passion, prejudice, bias, or sympathy. 
You each know from your common experience the nature of pain and suffering, disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life. And you also know the nature and function of money. The task of equating the two so as to arrive at a fair and reasonable award of damages requires a high order of human judgment. For this reason, the law can provide no better yardstick for your guidance than your own impartial judgment and experience. You are to exercise sound judgment as to what is fair, just, and reasonable under all the circumstances. You should, of course, consider the testimony of the plaintiffs on the subject of their discomforts. You should also scrutinize all the other evidence presented by the parties on this subject, including, of course, testimony of medical doctors who appear. After considering the evidence, you shall award some money that will fairly and reasonably compensate the plaintiff for his or her pain and suffering, disability, impairment, loss of enjoyment of life, approximately caused by the defendant's products. Elizabeth Ronnie, Roslyn Barden, and Darlene Etheridge have asserted loss of consortium claims. A spouse is entitled to the services of his or her spouse in attending to the household duties companionship and comfort, and consortium, that is, marital relations. A plaintiff who is awarded a verdict is entitled to fair and reasonable compensation for any loss of impairment of his or her spouse's services, society, or consortium because of the injury sustained by him <coughs> or her as a proximate result of the defendant's products. Damages may be awarded not only for the total loss of services, but for a worsening of their quality. The period of this loss is calculated from the onset of plaintiff's symptoms from mesothelioma until death. Your oath as jurors requires you to decide this case fairly and impartially without sympathy, passion, bias, or prejudice. You are to decide this case based solely upon the evidence that you find believable and in accordance with the rule of law that I give you. Sympathy is an emotion which is normal for human beings. No one can be critical of you feeling some degree of sympathy in this man. However, that sympathy must play no part in your thinking and in the decision you reach in the jury room. The defendants are corporations. Under the law, a corporation is entitled to be treated the same as anyone else and is entitled to be treated the same as a private individual. Similarly, your decision must not be based upon bias or prejudice which you might have developed during the trial for or against any party. Your duty is to judge this case impartially, and a decision based on sympathy, passion, bias, or prejudice would violate that duty. You are not advocates for either party. You are the judges of the facts. Remember the instructions that I gave you at the opening of this case, that you must not conduct any investigation or research of any nature whatsoever relating to this case. You must not use the internet or any other resource for any purpose at all relating to this case. You must not even look up the meaning of a word in the dictionary. You are to consider only the evidence presented to you in this courtroom and the instructions as to the law that I give you. As I indicated in my preliminary instruction to you, if I determine that any of you has violated this rule, it may result in a mistrial or in a penalty being imposed on the person who violated the rule or fails to advise the court if another member of the jury has violated this rule. Your sole interest as jurors is to determine the truth from the evidence that has been presented to you here in this courtroom in this case. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reaching an agreement. You can do so without compromising your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with the other jurors. Since this is a civil case, any verdict of 5 to 1 or 6 to 0 is a legal verdict. Therefore, it is not necessary that all six jurors agree on each question. An agreement of any five jurors is sufficient. All six jurors must deliberate fully and fairly on each and every question. And all six jurors must determine and vote upon each question. It is not necessary that the same five jurors agree upon the answers to all questions. Whenever at least five jurors have agreed to an answer, that question has been decided, and you may move on to consider the remaining questions in the case if it is appropriate to do so. All six jurors must participate fully in deliberating on the remaining questions. A juror who has been outvoted on any question 
shall continue to deliberate with the other jurors fairly, impartially, honestly, and conscientiously to decide the remaining questions. Each juror must consider each question with an open mind. But at least five of you have agreed upon a verdict, knock on the jury room door, indicate to the attendant you've reached a verdict, and say nothing more. The attendant will escort you back to the jury box so that the court may receive your verdict. I have prepared jury verdict sheets, jury verdict sheets excuse me, for each of the four plaintiffs, which I believe should make your task simpler. I will be sending one copy of each of those verdict sheets with you to the jury room. The sheets have questions that you must consider and answer within the framework of the instructions that I have given you. I will now review those questions with you. I'm only going to review one because they are all the same, but you must take each one separately into consideration. I'm going to review uh, the verdict sheet that's been prepared for uh, David and Darlene and Rich, as an example. Note, at least five jurors must agree on the answer to each question. The same five jurors do not have to agree on each answer. Your votes for each question must be five to one or six to zero. Please answer each question separately and be sure to follow the instruction below each question. Questions must be answered in the order they are presented. Question one. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge was exposed to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top products? Defendants Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Inc. are listed separately. Each one has a yes or a no. And then there's a vote um, for each one. The vote must be five to one or six to zero. For any defendant or defendants to which you have answered yes, proceed to question two. If you answered no as to all defendants, do not proceed further. Tell the court aid that you have reached a verdict. If you answered no as to one defendant, do not proceed further as to that defendant. Do proceed to question two for the defendant as to which you have answered yes. Question two, so this deals with failure to warn. Have the plaintiffs, David and Darlene Etheridge, proven by preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' towel products were not reasonably fit, suitable, and safe for their intended or reasonably foreseeable uses because they lacked an adequate warning or instruction? There's a notation there for Johnson & Johnson and one for Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated indicates yes or no, and then the vote. The vote must be five to one or six to zero. Remember, this is for any defendant for whom you answer uh, question one, yes. For any defendant as to which you answer yes, proceed to question three. For any defendant or defendants to which you answer no, proceed to question number four. Question three. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendant top products that lacked an adequate warning or instruction was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma? Again, the defendants are separately indicated, yes or no, and then a vote which must be five to one or six to zero. Proceed to question number four. Question number four is with regard to the design defect claim. Question four, have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' talc products were defectively designed because the risk or danger of the product as designed outweighed its usefulness and therefore a reasonably careful manufacturer or supplier would not have sold the product in the form in which it was sold. There's an indication there for Johnson & Johnson and one for Johnson & Johnson <coughs> Consumer Incorporated, yes or no, and then a vote, five to one or six to zero. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answered yes, proceed to question five. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answered no, proceed to question six. Question number five. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top products that were defectively designed was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma? The indication of Johnson Johnson, Johnson Johnson Consumer Incorporated, yes, no, and then a vote, five to one, six to zero. Proceed to question six. 
Question six is with regard to the manufacturing defect claim. Question six. <coughs> have plaintiffs stated in their lien efforts proven by a preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' top products were defectively dis manufactured because their composition deviated from the defendant's design, specification, or standards? Johnson Johnson, Johnson Johnson Consumer Inc. Yes, no, vote 5 to 1, 6 to 0. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answer yes, proceed to question 7. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answered question, you answered no to question six, but yes to question three or five, proceed to question eight. Question seven. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by a preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top products that were defectively manufactured was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma? Johnson Johnson, Johnson Johnson, Consumer Inc. are separately set out, yes or no, and the vote, five to one or six to zero. If you answered yes as to either defendant on question numbers three, five, or seven, proceed to question eight. If you answered no to questions three, five, and seven, for all defendants, do not proceed far further and tell the court if you have reached a verdict. Next section is damages. Question number eight. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate David Etheridge for his lab loss earnings? And there's the amount and a vote. Remember, five to one, six to zero. Now, I'm going through Mr. Um, Etheridge's uh, burden sheet. Remember that if, uh, with regard to the other plaintiffs, none of the other <coughs> plaintiffs have a loss earnings claim. So you're not going to see that question if you get to it as to the any of the other plaintiffs. Proceed to question nine. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate David Etheridge for his past disability impairment, loss and joy of life, and pain and suffering? There's a line there for an amount, and then a vote, five to one, six to zero. Proceed to question 10. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate David Etheridge for his future disability impairment, loss and enjoyment of life, and pain and suffering? And there's a line there for an amount, and the vote, five to one, six to zero. Question 11. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate Darlene Etheridge for her past loss of David Etheridge's Spousal Service Society and Consortium? There's a line there for the amount and the vote. Proceed to question 12. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate Darlene Etheridge for her future loss of David Etheridge's Spousal Services Society and Consortium? There's an amount there and then the vote. Uh, remember that three of the plaintiffs have a spousal uh, consortium claim. Ms. McNeil does not. Proceed to question number 13. Question 13. If you answer yes as to both Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated in any of the questions 3, 5, or 7, set forth the percentage that you find describes or measures their contribution to the cause of David Etheridge's mesothelioma. The percentages must add up to 100%. So you have Johnson & Johnson there, um, and there's a line for the percentage. And then Johnson Johnson Consumer Incorporated, and there's a line for the percentage. I think what's missing here is the vote, which must be five to one, six to zero. So we will make sure that you have a verdict sheet that actually has a spot for you to list the vote. And then please tell the court if you've reached a verdict. There is a, a line there for the jury four person to, uh, to sign off, and then the date. The four person for this jury is juror number one. Four person ensures that each juror deliberates, writes any questions the jury may have for the court, and marks the verdict and vote on the jury question sheet. When a jury returns to the courtroom, the four person must report the verdict to the court by giving the vote and answer each of the questions on the jury verdict sheet as they are read by the court. After you have begun deliberations, all communications are done by sending a note from your four person. Knock on the door, hand the note to the attendant. No member of the jury should communicate with anyone outside the jury room except Ms. Fashion. 
No member of the jury should indicate at any time how the jury stands numerically or otherwise until after you reach the verdict. <coughs> when I receive your note that you have reached a verdict, the attorneys will be gathered and I will have the entire jury into the court to receive the verdict. Should you desire to communicate for any other reason, you must send a note in the same fashion. After I have read your note, I will discuss it with the counsel and then reply to you in open court on the record. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service on this journey. We realize cases interfered with your daily lives, caused you inconvenience, and caused you uh, more inconvenience when I've asked you to stay additional days and after hours. And I do appreciate it, and the parties and the attorneys do as well. You know, I said in the beginning, our judicial system can't function without people like you. And I tell jurors when I read them in the jury assembly room, and I swear on jurors, that literally every courthouse in the United States would have to close. There weren't the people left me that came to jury duty, not knowing what would happen, but uh, ultimately took an oath to serve as jurors and fulfill that duty, the greatest duty, frankly, one of citizenship and thank you.